sampling really? I mean, the way I look at it is sampling is, uh, you know, it's a strategy. Uh, and the strategy here in the here in the schematic, as you can see, are these boxes that we put to really survey uh, for our species of interest in this case, you know, these 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 uh, uh, balls, really. So sampling is a strategy to really optimize and gain, um, uh, you know, data uh, for your question of interest. Um, it's a collection of observation, or it's a way of collecting observation. It can be completely arbitrary or natural. You know, you don't really put any system to it, or you can uh, randomize it or make it systematic, you know, sort of representative to certain factors in a landscape, you know, for instance, for mountain ungulates, you know, if you want to, let's say, uh, survey for argali, which is a wild sheep found mostly in rolling habitats, you would have to ensure that you, uh, you know, systematically sample all the rolling habitats, for instance, or most of the rolling habitats, or for, in or for instance, with ibex, which is a more uh, rugged, lo cliff-loving species, uh, in order for it to be representative, you have to make sure you do uh, sample those cliffs. So that's what representative sampling really means. Um, samples have to be independent from each other, so we don't have pseudo-replication. We can discuss that if we want. And as I said, more samples, the better, because higher sample size means your data is more likely to be precise. And you can then use you know, your sample to extrapolate uh, and estimate uh, results to larger population sizes. So basically, as I said, yes, sampling or representative sampling especially is a strategy to get as accurate data as possible. But at the same time, there are some common sources of error in population estimates, especially for mountain ungulates. What are these? There's detection error. You know, uh, detection error is everything to do with detecting your uh, species of interest or, uh, yeah, species of interest, you know. Um, then there is sampling error, uh, which is to do with how you've, your sampling strategy. Again, both of these things, as you can see here, they influence the accuracy of your data. And as I said previously as well, we need to consider sample size in order to detect the changes in population, which influences precision. So there are these two types of errors, um, and they're not necessarily always mutually exclusive. Um, so you have to really think about that. So can I, uh, uh, yeah, we'll just talk about detectability very quickly, and I apologize, this, this slide is a bit too text heavy. So to compare populations over space and times, we need a constant detection probability, or, a or for changes in detective, uh, detectability to be corrected. So, you know, if your detection uh, probability changes over time, uh, it's, it's really hard you can compare those two populations. So you really need to think about detectability. And factors that affect detectability of species, especially mountain ungulates, uh, and this is part of the reason why I think Justine asked the question is, things like terrain, for instance, you know, if you have very, very rugged terrain, you're likely to miss uh, ungulates, especially ungulates such as markhor or, or ibex that are really, really cliff and rugged area loving species biology, which sort of ties in back to the terrain, a lot of the goat species, the true goats, you know, your, um, again, your Rilex, your Markhor, uh, even to a certain extent, uh, Himalayan Thar, for instance, which is not, not necessarily a true goat, but more goat-like. You know, these species are really found in uh, these cliffy habitats. Uh, also female uh, mountain ungulates uh, of certain species are known to really far, go far away in these, you know, inaccessible areas when they're giving birth. So that will affect the detectability. Climate, of course, you know, winters uh, are snowed in, uh, visibility is really low. So depending on which uh, time of the year, it's most, more season than climate. Um, the time of survey, many ungulates are known to, to rest in the afternoons and sort of be more active uh, in the morning and in the, in the evening. There's really good work coming out on this uh, on Alpine Ibex from Italy, I think, that shows, you know, they're more active during the mornings and they sort of uh, rest during the day. So clearly, you know, if you start surveying for them in the peak of the day, you might miss them out. And of course, observer efficiency, which is how good an observer is, how fatigued he or she may be, are all things that are going to affect detectability, more so in the mountains. And if we don't correct for detectability, uh, results, um, 
you know, are most likely to be to be quite biased and hence um, potentially inaccurate. Um, I want you to think about it and don't get, get too uh, frazzled by the equation is think about detectability in the following way. So just to walk you through this equation, uh, N is the abundance, is the true abundance, you know, of a species. Let's say, you know, in the background, you can see this is my field site. Let's say if you want to know how many blue sheep, uh, which is a mountain ungulate found uh, in and across the Tibetan plateau, uh, and it's marginal mountains, how many blue sheep are found here? We never know truly how many there are. So that's what this capital N stands for. But we go out and let's say do a kind of survey, whatever it is, we count them. That's called the count statistic, which is the C right here. So that's what we count. But truly, how many there are depends on our, uh, this little P, which, is, which stands for detection probability. Uh, and it's some, uh, it's the it's multiplication of this detection probability uh, into n that results in our in our c being there. In other words, let's say we detected every individual that's found in our steep study site, then obviously our what we count will be equal to what's there. But more often, we don't count everything. So this p needs to be estimated because it's usually less than one, and that's what. Uh, this is, is is really showing that you know the abundance is, is truly uh, equal to the count statistic divided by the population. Um, so yes, inferences about n require inferences about p. So you should always think about detectability really. Um, so yes, so dealing with variation in detectability, how do you deal with different variations? So one is to standardize, uh, and this is to go back to Justine's question. We can standardize. We can think about uh, the variation sources that we can that can cause variation in detection, so we can identify and control them. For an example, if we know mountain ungulates are more active during the early hours of morning and less active during the middle hours of the day, what we should ensure is all our surveys are done at similar times across the day in the morning, rather than you know, at different times. The other thing we can, other variation source that we can definitely identify uh, to a certain level is uh, experienced or not experienced uh, observers. So what I would say is, you know, training for observers is extremely critical. So that's a variation source we can potentially identify and control for. The other uh, standardization we can do in methods is equipment. You know, clearly in, mount in the mountains, distances are huge. So, you know, Sometimes what you detect and not detect is a function of how good your binocular or your spotting scope is. So ideally, I would uh, suggest that people have as many, uh, you know, the same uh, and good quality, of course, type of binoculars or spotting scope. So you can really standardize uh, these things such that their effect on detectability is similar or, uh, or uh, it doesn't affect detection probability. The other source, the other sources of variation are covariates. Uh, what this basically means is, you know, generally environmental covariates are also so, uh, surveyor covariates. You know, these are variation sources that can be identified, but not controlled, but they can be measured and their impact on the observation can be modeled. So for instance, you know that, you know, the topography of a landscape might affect um, detection. But how does that affect detection? We don't really know. Its impact on detection we can model by measuring how rugged a landscape is, or how, um, you know, how rolling a landscape is, and then running that as a covariate uh, to test for its effect on um, detection. And lastly, which is the worst, and you know, something you know, one cannot do anything about it. One way of dealing with it is just by prayer, because these are variation sources that we cannot even identify, not not control. Or measure, and there are many such variation sources. You know, there's random errors that pop in. You know, even after uh, training observers for multiple, multiple days, maybe just on that given day, the observer is not feeling too well, or you know, um, for whatever reason, you know, he or she is not identifying ungulates that well, or you know, even though we know uh, ungulates are generally active during the morning, maybe a group of ungulates will uh, prefer to 
you know, rest during the morning rather than the afternoon. So these random sources of error, you cannot identify. But I think with this slide, what I want everyone to take away is that there are these three things that you should be thinking of when you think of detection. What can you standardize? What can you use as covariance if possible? And what can you potentially not even identify? And how might that affect your, um, your data? So the conclusion is, it's important to estimate detectability. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you know this, but I hope by me sort of picking away and sort of, you know, chiseling away at these uh, dimensions of detectability uh, is a little helpful. So like, just a quick activity now. Um, can And people can just type in the chat or, uh, you know, so, sort of just uh, open the next speaker. Can you list two or more social sources of detection and sampling error uh, preferably each, you know, two detection errors and two sampling errors for mountain ungulates in your study area or, you know, your area of knowledge. What might they be? And I will also type my results, uh, my uh, sources. So think about, um, think about the ungulates that you might be interested in. They don't necessarily have to be ungulates in solar leopard landscape, but think about mountain ungulates. So we have something similar. Uh, and what might affect detection and sampling error. So Stefan has written detection error, weather, terrain, behavior, correct? Behavior of animals or behavior of observers, Stefan, or both? But everyone, Ranjana says weather, terrain, yes. Experience, and can, uh, can maybe people be more specific as well? You know, if people are, uh, um, maybe, you know, with a species they, they know, you know, maybe Asiatic ibex, there might be uh, certain factors that are more, um, they affect detection more than, let's say, other factors. Sampling accessibility of area, Stefan, that's a very good point. Vijay says experience of observer, that's also a very good point. Sherry has said detection error, terrain and observer experience, definitely. If they are as well, good point. Sampling only reachable areas, as most places are rugged and steep. Extremely true. Chloe says terrain and rough terrain roughness and weather. True. Oh, very very interesting point by Amin is time of year. I completely agree. Breeding or non-breeding season will affect uh, um, the you know the detectability, and I think. That's, uh, that's an example of uh, something that affects both detection and sampling error, right? You know, what your, that's, your sampling design might be uh, leading to the error because you choose the wrong um, time of the year, but at the same time, it's also le uh, leading to detection error. So when you think of error, don't think of them necessarily as two uh, mutually exclusive things. Uh, Chloe says, uh, uh, in Canada where I work, Migration would, oh, very interesting, Chloe. That's true. So it's movement. It's basically movement. Uh, uh, okay, Nilofo says detection errors, dense vegetation, species rarity. Interesting. So that's an interesting factor of the population itself. Detection equipment, yes, as we said. Okay, have I missed somebody's answer? Amit has said terrain and animal movement, coloration. That's a very interesting one, yeah, because camouflage can be a, can be a big role. Uh, Shoaib says, hunting disturbance by human and livestock. Yeah, that's very true. There's lots of good work that has shown that uh, depending on how uh, people and uh, ungulates interact, they can either be very, very comfortable near people or very, very skittish and run away. So that's going to impact these things. Okay, I think we can move on. Great. I mean, these are lovely examples. Thank you everyone for these great examples. And again, feel free to unmute your mic and say these things because I don't want everybody to just be listening to me. But I hope this gets everyone a favor and, you know, a chance to really voice their opinions. Uh, yes, <laughs> Chloe says, you this right distance sampling uh, estimates are impacted if the species run from you. Exactly. And we're going to talk about distance sampling just in a bit. Uh, oh, there's more answers coming in. Nilofa says sampling error, study design, and sam uh, sampling methods could definitely affect. Correct. Okay, so let's 
uh, thanks everyone and feel free to uh, oh, uh, Sundar Shafka, have you raised your hand? Did you want to say something? I see there's a raise your hand. Or am I? Okay. If you do, please feel free to unmute and say something and we will continue. So great. Now we know there's many sources of detection and sampling error. Um, moving on, uh, I mean, this is just a couple of slides about, you know, potential sources of error from my field site in India and Kyrgyzstan where I work. Um, so obviously weather and uh, climate and, and weather, this was one time we were doing hunger surveys and it snowed. Obviously, when it snows like this, you can barely see um, 10, 15 meters, let alone where the mountain angulus are going to be. So that affects a potential source of error. Uh, this is another potential source of error where, you know, we had one uh, observer observing such a huge area, which has so many different sort of, you know, variations and uh, sort of land formations that we're going to miss. Um, potentially miss, or most likely going to miss ungulates in these areas. Um, we were surveying for blue sheep uh, in this particular instance. And again, this is an example both of detection and of sampling error. And lastly, uh, my friend is going to team me to show you this, but you know, sometimes you might have uh, observers who uh, take a rest while they're detecting uh, things. So that's obviously going to affect detection error. But this is just for representation. But yeah, just to get us thinking about sources of error. So now let's quickly dive in to some of the a few traditional ways uh, that people have used uh, to monitor ungulates, especially mountain ungulates uh, in Central Asia, but it's applicable to mountain uh, systems across the world, really, you know, North America, and even Europe, of course, uh, largely. So the most simple and uh, quite often used method is the total count method. What is the total count method? As the word total count implies is it's a method where you're assuming that you're counting all individuals. So the density that, you're, uh, that you um, estimate that angulate is whatever you count, you divide by the area. So this is what it looks like basically. And the other assumption is uh, and when you say detecting all individuals, you're basically saying that, you know, the detection probability, which I spoke about previously, is one. And this is what it looks like, you know, Let's say you have this area, and you know there's, uh, you know, these six ungulates in this area. These are African ungulates, so so what they, they truly are. But let's say they are mountain ungulates. You know, if there's six of them, uh, you go out and count, and you say you got six of them, and that's that's all that's there. So that's total count. There's the block count uh, method. It's very similar to total count, but it's slightly different, of course. Uh, in block count, what you say is, let me also pop up the schematic because it might be easier, excuse me. Um, so the abundance is C, which is, you know, the, the number of animals that are counted, divided by um, uh, alpha, which is the proportion of area sampled. So let's say your area is this entire blob right here. But what you do is you don't sample this entire area, unlike total count, you only, you, you, know, you put these block, blocks that you count. Um, some vantage point surveys are, are, are similar to, to block counts, depending on how you define your study area. And that's what your uh, denominator really is. Similar to total count, with block count, uh, what we say is, you know, detection uh, probability is one. And uh, that, you know, blocks and strips, uh, I, I call it block count, but, um, you know, we can also have uh, strips, literally just a single transects that you count either side of are randomly placed within this uh, study area. So that's block count, you know, that's another way to, to estimate uh, ungulates. The third way, uh, we have something in the chat, I think. Um, okay, sure. And the third way is distance sampling. Um, I will provide you guys with a, a little uh, document which has, has this as well, so you know, you can look at it. So distance sampling, um, again, I'm not really uh, an expert of distance sampling, but um, just to give you a sense of it, uh, what happens is, yes, yeah, so you have an area of interest, uh, and then in that area of interest, you have a transit that you saw, let's say this line that you see right here, and you have your species of interest, you know, these little black dots that you see here. And while you're surveying along these lines, you're going to be able to see these different 
species and you know you you record them but what you also record is this perpendicular distance from the line to that angular and as you can see from this little graph here as the distance increases the assumption is that the detectability or the de detection probability of that uh, species of interest will decline and become zero after a certain distance which is logical right um, the way distance sampling works really is that abundance uh, that you're looking for is a function of uh, your count, what you count, divided by the proportion of area sampled times the detection probability. So that's what you measure in it. And you know, detection probability is modeled as a function of distance from the transect. So what you see in this graph. The key assumptions here are, and this is something to keep in mind, because just in a couple of minutes, we'll do a little activity to think about these methods, is that transits, which is this line right here, and points are randomly located in this area of interest. Now imagine if this area of interest was a massive area of interest. So to really sample it uh, you know, well, you would have to place these transits as randomly as possible. The other key assumption is the probability on the line itself is one. So whatever ungulate or species of interest that you uh, are interested of, if they're on this line, you will 100% detect them. And you, uh, the objects are detected at their initial location. So let's say when, when I say I detected this little ungulate here, I detected it or that group at that location because that's what their initial location was, not somewhere else. So there are these key assumptions of distance sampling. Just a little more in depth of distance sampling, but don't worry because this lecture is not about distance sampling. This is just to acknowledge that distance sampling is a very important and interesting method, but potentially you might have some shortcomings, which we'll discuss in a bit. Just the data that one needs to collect uh, for distance sampling is, uh, let's use using these two schematics, is survey location. So it's literally where the, look, uh, the surveyor is the distance to the observed herd or the individual, which as you can see, uh, let's say if there is a mountain right here and Ibex on the top, it's this distance here that you can measure using trigonometry. I won't go into it because then I said again, it's not about distance sampling, but just to give you a flavor, if one would want to try that. The number of herds in, uh, the number in the herd, you know, with a note taken if uh, some may be out of sight. The angle from the north of the herd location, which is this angle, that you can take, you know, looking at the geographic magnetic north and then uh, taking this, this angle, which is alpha, and the angle of the slope between the surveyor and the herd, which is B. Uh, these angles obviously help you uh, for, to, to estimate some of these other uh, things if you don't have, uh, let's say, range finders or whatever. So this is what uh, distance sampling really looks like uh, quickly. But what I would like us to do, um, let's, we can go into breakout rooms, um, and I will just, uh, in the chat, I will drop in um, you know, the previous slides, I put them on a Word document, and I will drop those in. And I would like everyone to discuss and list, I mean, I'll go through them after we come out of the breakout rooms. But can people just, even if people don't know, uh, you know these uh, methods too well, uh, or oh, Luciano has said something, let me just read that out. So basically two angles, one on the horizontal, one on the vertical, exactly Luciano, that's right. Um, so let's, let's discuss and list some of the issues with these approaches. Uh, you know, even if you don't know these approaches or haven't applied them in the, uh, these approaches in the mountains, just from what I just said in the last three slides, which will be in the document I provide you, can we already think about some of the shortcomings? I will then discuss these shortcomings subsequent to us rejoining from the breakout room, and then maybe talk about how, you know, the double observer method might help us um, deal with that. Um, so cool. So yes, Chloe, the point you write here, you, uh, you'll discuss in the, in the breakout room. So let me just stop sharing quickly. We'll put, I'll just put the, let me just put the file in the chat here. Give me a second. Uh, my computer, just give me a minute, everyone. Um, I'll just put a file to this PC. There we go. 
So you guys can see there's a, oh, it's not allowing me to the file. Um, one second. Sorry, guys. Uh, Justine, can you help me quickly? So, sure. it says, uh, so I'm trying to put a Word document into the chat. It says net, network disconnected. Uh, I'm not sure uh, um, okay. about that. Okay, can, so you no share, can you share the screen? Is it a big document? No, it's not. It's just because uh, I was hoping that people would go into different um, uh, rooms to discuss, like the breakout rooms to discuss, and I wanted them to have that file. Uh, but maybe I can make it into a PDF. Just give me a minute. Um, or can you so, copy the text and put it into the chat, and then we can? Uh, just give me a second. Sorry, everyone. Just bear with me. Let's see if this works. Okay, let's try this. Oh, oh, and if it doesn't work, we can just discuss like this as people are doing, which is also fine. No, it's not. Uh, uh, sorry guys, one, two more minutes and then if it doesn't work, we will discuss the way it is. So yeah, just start thinking about some of these points that we're already seeing. Mm -hmm. Stefan, do you want to share more about the total counts thing, comment yes. you said in the chat? Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, what we call total counts often are not really considered to be total counts. We do it in mm -hmm. Tajikistan for the wildlife conservancies managed by local communities and private concessions. Mm -hmm. So a total count is actually a, a count which uh, assumes to represent a minimum number present. So they, they try to exclude any repeated counts of the same animals so that at the end it's very likely that uh, there are at least uh, not less animals present than actually counted. The problem mm -hmm. with, is this is a, a good for instance for setting uh, hunting quotas because this, uh, you can be sure this is a true a minimum mm -hmm. number present. Yeah. There might be more but likely not less. Uh, the problem is a, a comparison between the years because there are of course variations which are not always explained by population dynamics but can be due to a varying detectability, usually due to weather conditions and sampling effort between the years so that not always the same area can be covered. So that's why the interpretation of the variation between the years is very difficult, but uh, often this is, uh, yeah, I would say it's a, a simple way to get a, a general idea, which is also politically understandable because the problem is also this decision makers have often problems with understanding uh, population estimates. Yeah, no, thanks, thanks, Stefan. That's very accurate. So what I've done now is, guys, I've put in uh, this other document method in the PDF. Um, and what, if we, uh, what I would like us to do, I'll, I'll break us up into a breakout rooms for maybe 15 minutes and just discuss some of these potential issues uh, with mountain ungulates uh, using these methods. And then we can come back and one person from that uh, group can sort of tell us a little bit more about uh, what they discussed, uh, right? And we can, and you guys can use the PDF that I dropped in as uh, a cue to uh, get more information about, you know, total counts, block count, distance sampling, and just think about its limitations. So I will, and then if um, Justine and Shaksa, you guys can go into different breakout rooms and just sort of facilitate discussion. Uh, I will do this manually. So let's put about. So I'm going to make six maybe five rooms with six participants, or maybe let's, let's make four rooms with eight. Okay, let's just give me a minute. Um, and when 
if you want us to discuss the potential concerns with these methods, mountain habitats, that's the question. Exactly. Exactly. The question is the potential concerns with these methods in mountain habitats. And then one person from that room comes uh, back and sort of gives us a, uh, uh, this, um, just like a summary of what they discussed. So cool. So Chatsa, you, you in two, three, four, five, six. And we can uh, pres also take on people's experiences related to different species. Uh, is Absolutely. that okay as well? That would be nice. So and and that would be super nice. Yes, please. So then that's room two. I'm just assigning rooms, guys. But yeah, I'm also putting you in a different room so you can facilitate. And please choose a, and I'll go from room to room, uh, but you guys can choose a room. Admin, there we go, add rooms. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just make four rooms rather than five so we can manage it. Cool, and just use the PDF to discuss. So I think now you guys will go to different rooms. Great, see you later. Morning. You guys in 15 minutes, yeah. <laughs> So, hi guys. Mm -hmm. Hi guys, so everyone's gonna come in, so we'll give it like a minute. We'll join back in. Great. Hi, everyone. We're back. <laughs> uh, we'll just get everyone. <laughs> What's that? No, it's great. Never mind. Yeah, it's, it's a bit it's a bit disconcerting, right? Like everybody goes away and then everybody comes back. But it's good that everybody comes back. <laughs> cool. We'll just give it a minute. Well, I think everyone's here now. Yes, I think everyone's here. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. Um, Nice, thanks, Rocky. So, shall uh, we have a very quick discussion, maybe four minutes each? Uh, people from Group One, from Chaksa's group, uh, do you want to start? Uh, just discuss about what you discussed and you know what you thought were shortcomings of these methods in in the mountains. So, uh, who who did you nominate, Chaksa? What is was it Amit that wanted to speak? Amit, do you want to do a quick? Yeah, hello. Yes, go for it. Yeah. Yes. So uh, basically about this total count and block count, uh, if we say all the factors which influence, uh, which we assume, uh, and all the assumptions which we make, generally like, uh, for example, if we say that we are counting all the animals, and then uh, so many times we don't consider the terrain, uh, all these factors would be highly, you know, uh, affecting our uh, count, especially in, in total count or this uh, block count also. So we were also discussing about the, in, uh, for block count, we were discussing like what should be the size of uh, our block depending on uh, species and how to decide that. So that also, uh, none of us had any answer to that. So it would be great to discuss with all of us. Great. Thanks, Amit. So that's group one's. Uh, group two, uh, Justine's group, uh, who did, who wanted to go? Yeah, uh, actually, this is Daniel. Go for it. Uh, okay, yeah, we talked about the total counts, which, uh, as also Stefan mentioned, uh, has the highest uh, biases and just give a general idea and uh, from where I come from in Iran, they uh, actually rangers and uh, lots of volunteers do this uh, biannually. 
in Iran and uh, actually it gives a general number of the population, but it's not uh, the population number that you can trust or base your uh, decision making process on it. And uh, because it has lots of uh, biases and it's not precise and accurate at all. And uh, about the block cons, I think the shortcoming might be that uh, when you're choosing the blocks, uh, randomly, it might have been. Uh, it might happen that uh, your blocks placed at uh, uh, the habitats with high quality, and uh, basically there are more unglazed there, and uh, it might bias your uh, estimates. And uh, about distance sampling, uh, I think uh, one issue would be uh, even uh, the equipments and providing them, even for example, such as range finders or these type of things. And it's not uh, actually applicable applicable in a certain habitats, such as uh, dense forests or uh, actually undulated uh, habitats, such as uh, mountains areas. Super. Thanks, thanks, Daniel. That seems like you guys had a nice discussion. So quickly then, uh, from Rocky's group, did you guys manage to choose somebody who would speak? Or yeah, Nelofa. Nelofa? Great. Yes. Yes, Nelofa, go, go for it. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Very oh, great. Yeah, great. And and thanks to Daniel for all the great explanation. We, we, we mainly actually covered all the issues that they discussed as well. So uh, we talked uh, mainly about blood count and distance sampling. Um, so with regards to uh, to blood counts, it, it, it is actually, it seems it's really important to uh, consider the size and the number of blocks, which is actually affect the accuracy and um, the accuracy of the data that you get, um, especially when you are facing a really large area with uh, different landscapes and habitats within. So probably you get uh, dense vegetation in some places and um, different, um, vegetation in others. So it's really important to consider these issues when you design your study. And um, so we actually came up to the idea that a minimum number of blocks uh, would definitely need to be discussed, um, first of all. And of course, the size of blocks is important. And about uh, distance sampling, uh, we discussed uh, the possibility and um, the difficulties or challenges of uh, estimating the distances between the observers and the species when you detect it. And uh, of course, based on the equipments that you use, as Daniel mentioned uh, earlier, it actually affects uh, the accuracy of the study because uh, in some cases you can actually detect the species, but uh, you can estimate uh, the distances be, uh, very accurate. So it definitely affects. Uh, all in all, we actually think that there's a trade-off between uh, the method or the technique that you pick to implement and the feasibility of that. So it's, it's really important that based on uh, the feasibility and the equipment, Nilofer, I think we've lost your voice. And all the experiences that you have as a team of observers. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, we lost you for a second, but now you're back. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just um, wrap it up with um, explaining about that's probably a trade-off between uh, feasibility and challenges of doing um, one of each methods and um, all the equipments and experiences that you get as a team of observers to do uh, one of them. So you probably need to uh, discuss all these concerns and then come up with the best method that you can use based on the species you study or the landscape you face. Thanks, thanks for that was a very um, sort of nuanced summary. So thank you. Uh, and the last group, uh, if there's anything different to add, or to echo some of the points. Anyone from the last group? Um, group four, I think. I just can want to add to what sure. has been said, uh, that uh, our colleague from Pakistan mentioned that in mountains often you have very limited opportunities where to work and from where to observe the area. And this, of course, in, impacts uh, the whole survey. And so it's, uh, it can cause bias in any method. Thanks, thanks, Stefan. 
Okay, so great. It seems like we've had a great discussion. So we have about half an hour left to the day. So what I will now do is I'll go back to the uh, presentation. I have listed some of these concerns as well. So they will echo a lot of what you guys are saying, but hopefully we'll give you a sense of um, why some of these methods are, are an issue. And maybe Amit, we will also tackle some of your questions as to how to optimize. And then I'll talk a little bit about a new method uh, called the observer method, uh, different from this, and how that might be uh, optimal uh, to use in the mountains. So, uh, so we can end on the, uh, the class on that today. So just bear with me while I share my screen again. Great. I guess you guys can see my screen now. So, so yeah. Uh, so yeah, you know, uh, as you guys very rightly discussed, you know, <clears throat> counting ungulates in the mountain is is quite a hard task. You know, sampling design based on random plots, lines. Points can seldom be achieved because, as Stefan just said, you know some areas are completely inaccessible, and you only go where you can go. For instance, or you know you're uh, forced to walking in straight lines uh, is not possible in most areas. This is where distance sampling becomes an uh, becomes an issue because you know even though there are a few methods now that can uh, account for non-straight um, transits, you know having a straight transit line for distance sampling, and then finding the perpendicular distance to those species from that uh, straight line uh, is important. It's an important message, uh, assumption of the method, and hence that gets violated often, if not uh, always. Sighting distances are extremely large between the animals. So again, with things like distance sampling, you know, uh, uh, what's it called, um, those distances cannot be measured, and hence the, the, uh, the method sort of falls short. Um, and although, you know, maybe detectability might be high, let's say, in these rolling open areas, animals are spread over such a large area that it's hard to count all of them. And this is where, you know, things like total count or even block count um, don't really fare well because, you know, again, where you place blocks is very biased. Uh, what you find in blocks might be, um, might be okay, but then, you know, there is a lot more of uh, uh, the, the area that you have to cover. So really, you know, you, you're getting issues with both the area that you're covering and the, the direction of the species of interest. Uh, just to distill out a little more, you know, specifically issues with total count and uh, block count, you know, they're very, very imprecise over large areas. Yeah, you can do a total count in a small area, but often over large areas, it's imprecise. The other very important point, I think it was said earlier in the discussion, is with total count, all you get is an estimate, and you don't have any errors. And when you don't have errors, you can't statistically compare population changes over time. So think about back to what I said about precision, right? See, if you're, uh, you're, you're, you never know how biased your result is because you, know, you never know the true population value. But if you know how precise they are, even if your estimate is completely wrong, you know, the bias, it's completely biased rather, if you have uh, error estimation and how tight those errors are over time, you know, it can give you a sense of trends at least, and that's what you can't do with total count. And hence, total count and block count uh, are not necessarily the best, best way to go forward because there is your probability of detection as one, and as we've discussed, that that's hard to achieve. Issues with distance sampling, as I said, many of its assumptions are hard to uphold in the mountains, which make them imprecise. Some of these assumptions are, you know, there's too many, the distances are large, perpendicular distance hard to meet, and there's evasive movement, there has been some studies that show that it can be done well with aerial surveys, you know, when uh, people are sort of flying over, but obviously these are extremely expensive, dangerous, and limited. Uh, yes, Luciano, I saw that. I, I have actually prepared all these references, uh, and I didn't share it previous to the talk. I thought maybe it'll be too much uh, to look at previously, but yes, I will, I, will, I will do that, and I'm happy to also, you know, give exactly what they are for, you know, if they're for distance sampling or if they're for methods in general. So definitely. 